Yeah. Oh gosh. It's been a day. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. Share. Let's see. Here we go. Hey. Awesome. Sarah's not on the call, but um let's do what is this? This is Sarah. Can you guys see this okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you see each other? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so this is Sarah. She ran Big Sur in April. Such a cool course. Um, I thought it was a cool picture. Anyways, she lives in Texas. Very tough course, but really pretty. Um, so we're going to talk about how to run strong in the summer without compromising your training because um, I'm assuming most of us have ran in the heat now and we might feel a little tired. We might feel a little sluggish or that's like a, a theme that we're feeling every single day. Um, that's normal in the heat because it's just an extra stressor on our body. And we already have stress in training, we have stress in our lives, and now we have heat stress. And we might also have stress like if we have a workout or something a little bit more than just general training stress, right? So the topic for today is all about fueling and some other things that we can do for summer running to feel strong. but. Fuel well and fuel often, or I like to say gel well, gel often, is um, something that we can really take with us, not just when we're running long runs or workouts or racing, but really we can also apply this to when we are running in the summer. So we're going to talk through heat adaptations, pace, nutrition, hydration, kit suggestions, any like little extras, and then some benefits for summer running. <laughs> so the impact of summer running, so the heat and humidity make running feel harder. I think we can all admit that that is something that we have probably felt this summer. I think every single summer we're surprised by it and we're like, oh yeah, this is summer running. Everything just feels harder. My heart rate's higher. I'm sweating more. Um, so both heat and humidity tax the body and it makes your heart rate rise. So you might have noticed that on your easy effort days or during workout days. It can take up to two weeks of running consistently in the heat for your body to adapt. So during that adaptation section of time, you'll notice that your heart rate's a lot higher, that pace feels harder, your legs probably feel sluggish. This is all normal. Every summer I have runners who like start freaking out. I'm like, you are okay. <laughs> you are still fit, you just have to adapt. And I think like I finally adapted this week because my heart rate is like back to like normal for like what I would consider normal, easy-ish running. Um, I'm running maybe just a touch slower, but my heart rate's looking really, really good. So if you're not there yet, you're probably really close, especially if you are running kind of closer to that five to six days a week right now. So your heart rate is beating quite a bit faster for the same pace, just trying to cool your body down. Um, so that's what's happening um, and your run's gonna feel harder because of that, which is all normal. So what we can do until we start to feel more comfortable with summer running. And maybe Meg's probably the best example on this call because she lives in Florida and we started having this convo about at least a month ago, at least. I mean, Meg's training season and, or her racing season ends in like late February because like it's starting to heat up. Um, so we've had this conversation. It's get to slow down. And I know that a lot, oftentimes that's super hard on our ego to like slow down, slow the pace down, but it really does 
help. It not only helps you get through the run, you can recover faster, but it's also going to really help um, with that aerobic build that we're trying to build in the summer as well, or that we are building in the summer. So the aerobic build or that aerobic foundation is like that foundation that we really want to set all the training on. So the slower you can run, really the stronger your foundation is going to be all within reason. We want to stay kind of in that more low zone two, zone one's fine, high zone two, not all the time. I don't recommend that all the time. Um, but slowing down your pace when it starts to heat up is really going to help. I got to run a second double last Friday and it was hot here. It was like close to a hundred degrees. And I had, I didn't know I had this second double. I just noticed it like the day before. So I don't know what happened. Anyways, I had Friday plans. So I had to go out at like four to get it done. So I'm in like the heat of the day and it was only three miles. Thank goodness. And I went out and I literally slowed my pace down to like 10 to 10, 10. So that's like 40 to 45 seconds slower than like the average this morning. And I just kept my watch on my heart rate and just kept like, just tried to keep track of my heart rate during the run and forgot about the pace. It was just a very, very slow jog. Um, and everyone gets to run slower in the summer. They may not, but they can. So it's not just you that gets to do it. Everyone, especially on the team, gets to do it. Um, and if it's something where running in the summer heat takes its toll, like last night we had our first track workout and it was hot. It was close to 100 degrees when we started our warm up. And when we got to the track, we adjusted. So some of the workouts had more walking recovery and you can add that into your workouts if you need it. You can also add it into like your easy effort runs you're building into, um, into building that aerobic foundation. You might need to walk. I know I walk when I get too warm or if I just need to take a break, if I'm running that infamous like three mile stretch west, like sometimes those hills crush me in the summer and I need to stop and walk. And that's totally fine. Walking doesn't make you any less of a runner. If anything, we're just trying to keep the heart rate down as much as possible. Now, again, after about 14 days, you acclimate and things feel a lot better and a lot easier. I think the the interesting piece to all of this is that you have to be consistent with the heat acclimation. So like Meg is super consistent because she can't get out of it. She cannot get out of it, even if she tried. She went to DC and it was like cooler, but it was still summer. <laughs> so she can't get out of it. So if you like run inside in like a really cool environment or maybe take maybe you're running three days and taking four rest days, like it's just going to take longer to acclimate because you're not doing it consistently for that like two week spread. Um, so I like the Strava brags on like how slow you can run in the summer because oftentimes um, I'll get people reaching out after I race and they're like, Whoa, how did you pull off that 5k? And they have like, you know, just like no concept about like the 80, 20 rule and aerobic running and how you can run slow to race fast. And so it can be really cool to be like, and I know I've talked about this before, probably on team calls, coaching calls and the podcast about like, make it a little game with yourself. Like how slow can I go today? Like how slow can I run without breaking down my running form and with really just making sure that I'm still staying like happy and healthy in the process. Um, and if you, of course, don't feel well running in the summer, or if you're on like a long run in the heat or humidity, you can absolutely stop your run. You can stop your workout. You can absolutely shut it down and call it a day. It's definitely not worth trying to push through and making it into something um, that turns into like a bigger health issue. Okay, I'm trying to get the slide to move. <laughs> there we go. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> is it Friday yet? Um, so all runs are going to feel harder in the heat and you want to make sure that you're not running on empty. So that's like founder, it's like this balancing act, right? Because how many of us run in the summer and we're like, wow, I have no appetite either before, during, or after. I know that happens to me. It's like a very dangerous territory to be in. And if you listen to the podcast this morning, some of you have, you know that like when you're running in the heat and humidity, you actually need more fuel. You need more carbohydrates to fuel your glycogen stores because they deplete a lot faster in the summer or in the heat. Your body's just using more to cool itself down. So I like to think of it as like the summer sun is melting your glycogen stores and you need to like fill it up. So just eating more. Um, I don't have an exact number, but I think like adding just one extra serving um, or one extra gel, or maybe like Ronald was super great with this on his last run. He intuitively, instead of every 30 yeah. minutes for gels, took gels every 20 or 25 minutes because that supported him and that got him through his long run. So to even shifting things just by five minutes could be a huge game changer in the summer. So you also want to start with a good breakfast or snack before you go out, carrying gels, carrying extra gels. Um, highly don't recommend using your spring energy gels on long runs because I tried it two weeks ago and I ended up taking like eight of them with me on this like 12 mile long run. And it was like ridiculous and heavy and those can be saved for workouts or something else. Um, but just making sure you have enough gels or chews with you, making sure you um, don't skip on the nutrition after the run. And one of the biggest components of this is going to be like in that 30 to 45 minute window after you run, really trying to consume something. So I said this morning, like simple and cold, right? So make it super easy. And if it's, if you really don't have an appetite, make it drinkable, make it super easy to digest. And that at least gets the recovery process started so you can then feel better for tomorrow's run or then hit that hard workout later in the week or that long run and um, and then watch the fitness unfold. <laughs> so staying well-fueled and hydrated is a key component to avoiding muscle cramps as well. Heat cramps, heat exhaustion, all of those things and just practicing like good, um, good judgment on that. So now with hydration, hydration is a huge piece to every day as an athlete. We want to make sure we have our handheld, we have our hydration vest. I like dropping other bottles on my planned long run routes. I think that's a great way to make sure that you have enough so you can refill your own handheld. Stopping at a coffee shop is also great. You can plan your routes around places that you can refill your handheld. Um, or again, using those dropped plastic bottles, um, I will keep them sealed. So if you know that they're, if you go to your bottle and it's unsealed, you'll know that someone tampered with it and then you won't want to use it. Right. I like packing like extra cold drinks in a mini cooler. So when I'm finished with my runs or my warmer runs, I can have like a bubbly water, a cold water. Um, and then I'm like in route to get an iced coffee ASAP. So that's a great thing to do. You can also put your handheld in the freezer. So when you start your runs, um, your water is basically frozen and it's going to melt pretty quickly. So that's a great idea. And then I recently heard too, like putting your gels in the freezer. And so as you're running, they're obviously going to like de dethaw and like soften up. And that's a great way to kind of keep them a little bit more on that cooler side. Um, so that's kind of unique. I haven't tried that. I don't know how long it takes to like unthaw gel or to thaw gel. So um, that could be interesting. And then of course, with water, you want to make sure that you're consuming enough. And I think this is probably the one area that like most of us kind of like miss the mark on because we really need so much more than we actually think we do, especially in the summer. We want to make sure that we have that 100 to 120 ounces of water a day. Maybe Ronald, Ronald, you drink a lot of water, so you might be good here. Um, and making sure the electrolyte mix, you're getting a serving or two 
that is critical. I talked to Melody about, yeah, you love the water, right? Talked to Melody today about the elements, and I talked about it on the podcast, like trying to take an out, at least one to one and a half elements a day, game changer. Instead of like, oh, I'm going to take half an element packet today. Like, why half? Just take the whole thing. You're fine. You need it. And it's going to make you feel so much stronger um, for the following day, which is great. It's where you want to be. And then, of course, with your training kit, you want to wear light colored clothing. You want it to be breathable. You can have some really fun sunnies, hat or visor, handheld bottle, hydration vest. Bring a towel, like maybe for after your run if you think you're going to need it, or an extra set of clothes for post run. I think that's critical. And then, you know, wearing sunscreen is a great option year round, even on the summer morning runs, making sure that you're wearing sunscreen, super, super helpful. You can get an SPF that's sweat proof and safe. Um, I like SPF 30 if I'm running early, if I'm running in any sort of like sun, sun, I'm wearing like 70, which is wild. Um, and if you're bringing a pace pal, a four legged pace pal, please make sure to bring extra water with that for them so they can consume that and be a happy, happy pet. Um, so here's some good ideas. I know a lot of us on this call really only have a very small, finite time to run. And that's the time that we run and we just have to work with it. And that's fine. And that's great. That's life. You can plan your runs though around the heat. So you can run early morning, you could run inside, or you can run later evening. What I love about the later evening is that, and I was sharing this with the summer group last night, like when we started at six o'clock, I was like, this is the hottest it's going to be all night. Like it's going to start to cool off. Maybe not for Meg. I don't think it cools off for Meg ever. It just holds. Yeah, it just holds. Um, but for most of us, it like cools off. So like you can think of it that way of like if you are going out later at night, think of it as like that first mile is going to be the warmest and then it's going to start to cool down and get cooler and cooler as that sun sets. Especially as we get through summer, I think we're going to notice that a little bit more than how we feel right now. Um, but that can be like a fun way to incentivize yourself to get outside, even if you are starting at like 6 or 6.30. Running with friends is obviously great. Um, that just helps. And then of course, planning your running routes around like shady areas. I think that's super beneficial and also making sure that you're safe. I think that's a huge component too. And know that's a huge component. So setting yourself up for success and kind of evaluating like what is the most important thing out of this run. And that's something we, we talk about often, right? That intentionality of the run, not just with pace, but like, when can you run? How do you run? Is it safe to run? If it's a really warm day, can you find a shaded route? Can you run with other people? All those things can kind of come into play and can really make um, make for a really strong training training run. And then you also, of course, want to listen to your body, right? Like be smart. You do not have to be the hero in the summer. Um, and all of you on this call, and I know all of you, all of you listening on this call, um, on the playback are smart. You're all smart. Like be smart. Your life does not depend on one run. So if you ever put something in final surge about like, I didn't feel safe on a run. I felt like I was overheating on a run. I have a niggle, like anything like that. Or, hey, like I had to cut this short. I had a 9 a.m. work meeting, whatever it may be. Like that's you and that's great. And as long as there's communication and dialogue around it, I'm going to support that. I think it, you know, there's always a slippery slope with that can come with that. I don't think anyone on this call trends on that slippery slope. And I'm also going to call out that slippery slope and see if we can find a way to like get back on track. So know if you ever think like you're straying a little bit too far, I'll try and like pull you back a little bit. 
But it's really important to listen to your body, to listen to your mind, to listen to your gut, and then communicate that. And that's like really all I can ask for. There's always going to be another run. Always. Not always, but you know, there's going to be another run. <laughs> so think of the benefits of heat. So I am embracing summer running. I'm definitely a fair weather runner. Like give me that fall weather, give me that spring weather. I love it. But we can really look at this like a huge glasses half full sort of mentality. It's a great heat training tool. You're going to come through the summer feeling so much stronger in the fall. It's unreal. It's like a training stimulus. So just like we train speed on the track, we train hills on the road, or we're training at altitude. All three of those things are stimuluses. So heat is one more stimulus that we're adding to your training. So that gets to be taken into account when there's when I'm writing like mileage and workouts and reps and paces, like knowing that there's that extra layer on top of it really does come into play, but it can all be there for your good. So um, what does heat training do? So it lowers your core temperature on the onset of sweating. This is once you acclimate. So after that, like two week window, it increases your plasma volume. So if your volume has increased, it can send blood to your skin faster to cool you down. So you're not sweating as much. Now, I think Melody and I would disagree with that because we're heavy sweaters, but you know, it's fine. Your heart rate decreases, which I have seen <laughs> proof of. I have seen proof of. Um, this week, you can go back and like look on my Strava if you want proof. It's like, it's so good. Um, now let's hope tomorrow. So good. Now that I've said that out loud, I'm like so superstitious with stuff like that. Um, yeah. And Meg. Okay. See how Meg, I haven't seen you run in person. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild. You get have increased oxygen consumption, which just helps overall, obviously with breathing. And then it improves your running economy, which means if your running economy is stronger, you're putting less effort into the same pace. So when we get through summer and you come up the fall, come into fall, you know, my favorite saying, um, you might see this pop up on social media tonight, summer miles bring fall smiles, right? Summer miles, all those warm, gross miles where Meg, Melody and I are just like sweating like beasts. They bring the fall smiles. So we have great fall fitness. You feel like a totally different runner. You feel like you've absolutely up leveled. And it's been from all the work that you've put in during the summer, which is so cool. It's one of my favorite like transitions. My least favorite transition is like winter to like that first hot day. And you're just like, ah. <laughs> like what is this? Not good. So if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. This is so true. I feel like most days, right? There's very few days that you can say like, this is a perfect day. We hope if we get one perfect day out of a training cycle, it's on race day. Because if we've put all that work in on other times in our training and we get that one perfect day and it's on race day, that's all that matters, right? That's all that matters. Okay, so that's it for summer running. Quick little run through. Um, we can open this up for Q&A on summer running. We can open this up for if anyone has any additional questions on spring energy or gel consumption, any specific training questions or general training questions, whatever you need. Um, I'm here to support. I have a quick question about the electrolyte intake during the day, like not during the run. Yeah. Um, if you run with electrolytes for most of your runs or all of them, <laughs> um, would you count needing to supplement with the extra electrolytes or toward? So 
I'm sorry, I'm not phrasing this very well, but you said you take like one and a half elements. Yeah. Do you include like what you take on during a run or is that additive? So that's additive. So okay. I'll take a scratch serving um, during workouts, during long runs, and then depending on how I feel for easy runs. Like this morning I carried a handheld. It just had plain water in it because I felt pretty hydrated. But there's days where I wake up and I'm feeling like very dehydrated and I'm like, whoa, I did a terrible job yesterday. I have to like get this train back on the track and like try and limit the damage. So I think it's really like up to you on how you feel like Meg, because you're in Florida and it's like such different conditions, I would say, you know, electrolytes and on every run and then after every run. Okay. Yeah. And Scratch makes a new hydration that's like the everyday hydration. So it doesn't have like the sugar and the carbs. It's more of like a noon kind of supplement, I think. Um, and I've tried, I think they have like a tangerine. I've tried that and it's really good. Oh, look at that. Cause that's what I get worried about is like liquid IV is so much sugar because you need that when you run, but then yeah. to have that like three times a day. It's a lot. And like we get to eat sugar as athletes, right? Yes. That's yes. totally normal. Totally. And I also get where you're coming from with like, it can start to add up and it might not be exactly what we're looking for. I think the feed has the scratch. It's called everyday hydration. Um, and that's what they replaced the hyperhydration with, which is funny. <laughs> um, everyday drink mix. Yeah. They have tangerine and orange, salted margarita, and lemon lime. Gatorade Zero. No added sugar, says Leanne. Gatorade Zero. Sports drinks are great. Really too. Absolutely. Sports drinks are awesome. Like... That's a great way to replenish. Meg, do you have like a mini uh, mini fridge like waiting for you outside your house when you get back? I have totally like, started doing the cooler. I leave a cooler outside by my car um, with wet towels soaked in that I put in the freezer and then put in a little bit of water. So they're like ice cold when I finish. And then yeah. I have the the cold drinks waiting for me. Yeah. Great. Oh, I it. like to find all the sprinklers on my routes. <laughs> the sprinks. Yes. That's so great. It helps so much. And it's like those little things, it can bring joy too. Like when I'm on a warm run, I'm thinking about my iced coffee as soon as I get back. And like, and also just, I think it's important to like remind ourselves that like, this is our time, right? It's probably like, the one time during the day that we have, if we're running alone, that we have to ourselves and to really use it in a way that serves us. Um, maybe we're thinking about a trip we want to take or a creative idea or rocking out to Taylor Swift or thinking about what Taylor Swift was going to announce on her hundredth show today in um, Scotland, whatever it could be. <laughs> Whatever it could be. Um, but it's our time and to like not rush it, right? Like if you rush it, I know Austin used to say this all the time. Like if you rush it, like you're rushing like what? Four minutes, three minutes. And that three minutes is actually doing you so much more like harm than like just taking three extra minutes to get through like an easier run. Um, right. Cause if we're pushing pace, it's probably like, oh, I'm running like 10, 15 seconds too fast per mile. We're not like running a minute faster per mile. I have a question or one yeah. thing I've always struggled with is knowing how much fluids I need during a long run. Yes. So to feel adequate, right, Melody? Yeah. 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 So I would take a sweat test 
um because that's going to tell you like one how much sodium you need during a run but then also how much water you're losing and then you can work kind of backwards from there so like um i did like a 60 minute sweat test last summer where i weighed myself if that's something that supports you um went out for a 60 minute run in the summer without water <laughs> it's totally brutal came back <laughs> weighed myself again and then it's like okay i lost four pounds or something ridiculous like melody it'll be like four or five pounds and then <laughs> you're like okay so for like every i think it's like 32 ounces that i lose i need to supplement with three to 500 milligrams of sodium and then you could think about like well if i lost four pounds how much water should i be consuming um, I don't know that exact answer in terms of like how much water you want to continue to drink. Okay. Great. Yeah. Science of Ultra Podcast has a couple of episodes where they go deep on this. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I know Megan Featherston has a sweat, sweat calculator. I don't know if she has that like, and this is how much you should be drinking um, on top of it. But I'll, I mean, I take like, I do lose I like four to five pounds in 60 minutes when I'm running with water. So I'll consume easy on a long run, like 80 ounces of water. It is stupid. Mm, okay. It's stupid. Yeah. So I plant bottles like on my long runs. Um, or if I'm in Denver and I'm like running past a coffee shop or something, they're really great about refilling, but you got to time it right. Especially if you have like quality in your run, you don't want to stop during the quality, obviously if you need water stop, but like, you know, just trying to be a little bit intentional with it. So, um, yeah. Thanks for that tip, Ronald. <laughs> You're so great. I have a question too. This is yeah. Annie, about, um, like when you need, well, I guess it depends on each person, but I noticed um, in one of my races, I had a handheld with electrolyte scratch in it and I just wanted water. Like it tasted too salty. Like I just needed water. So do you carry like two handhelds, like one with water, one with electrolytes, or like you stick something in a running belt or do you have any suggestions yeah. there? Yeah, I know like some people wear like a hydration vest that has two bladders. Oh. So one will be just water, the other will have the electrolyte mix in if you want to alternate. Okay. I'm of the runner who needs to have all the salt possible. Okay. A whole run. So like I'll never turn down some electrolytes <laughs> while running. Um, but I get it. I get it. It's like the flavor sometimes or whatever the case may be, maybe it's in a marathon you're, or in a race, like a longer race, you're just like, oh, wow, I just want water. But what's yeah. great about if it happens during a race is that there's usually water tables every yeah. meal to two. So you could always bank on the water tables to grab actual water and then keep your hand held with the electrolytes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing. That worked out beautifully. But I was curious, like, if you're on a super long run. But, again, if you're planting water bottles, then you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I struggle with that, too. And what I, I've also ruined bladders by getting them too sugary. So oh. I will use, like, the vest with the bladder and just have water. And then I get, like, soft flasks and stick them in my vest. And that has the electrolytes in it. And I'll, like, hyper-concentrate those. Oh, so sorry. then I can like switch back and forth between them and I'll do that for usually when I start hitting like the two hour like run mark is when I start doing that. Yeah, that makes sense. That's great. Oh, thank you. That's great. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I actually have two questions if that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you are feeling thirsty while you're running, is that like a prop like is it like you know how when you're like thirsty yeah they're like oh it's too late you're dehydrated is it the same when you're running yes yeah okay it's it's pretty bad you don't want to get to that place where you're running and you're thirsty and you're just like taking in water or taking in electrolytes and it's nothing's moving the needle i've raced a few marathons that way <laughs> it's 
terrible. It's like you end up taking like you have your hand held, you're running, you come through a water table, you stop, you take four glasses of water, you continue to run like nothing is working because you're just like sweating it all out. Um, so trying to be really diligent or just maybe a bit more focused on the days leading up to like the workout. So like if we have Wednesday workouts, that Tuesday, I think is a really great day to focus on extra hydration. Um, and then also on like Friday, um, that would be another great day. If your long runs okay. on Saturday. Yeah. It's a okay. dangerous place to be. It's not fun. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that way during New York. I was like thirsty and I felt that way during a long run recently. So that's good to know. Yeah. Um, second question. So I'm trying to do most of my runs in the morning, but in the morning it's a lot cooler. Yeah. But then like yesterday I felt like I was slapped in the face when I ran during in the evening. <laughs> so do you feel, do you think I should try to do like some training runs in more of like heat? So Wednesday workouts aren't so tough. Oh, Heather. That's such a tough question. Um, because I don't want to take your joy. <laughs> I mean, oh gosh. I think it's like thinking about thinking about the long-term goals. So Heather's running Chicago. Um, Meg's running Chicago. Woohoo. And woo. Like last night, we all cheered really loud for the Chicago team. Leanne's running Chicago. Woo! I think it's because, I don't know. I love that race. I just, oh, it's the best. It's the best. Um, so, oh, I mean, yes, running in the heat would, uh, would make Wednesday nights feel easier. I think it's thinking about like, do you want to give up your morning runs and changing your schedule to run after work um, to make Wednesday nights feel easier? Yeah. You know, I, do you to acclimate to like heat? Do you need to do is this is I mean, this is such a pointed question, but I feel like so you do you need to do like a certain number of hours in the heat you think to acclimate like what it, I don't know. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. It's about like a two week span. So it's not really like a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you were going out, I know you're training, so it's not like you're going out for like a 10 minute run, right? Like you're going out for 45 to 60 minutes most days, if not longer. So that would suffice. Like that would be enough. Um, I would think about it because you didn't do that last summer and you still rocked New York dehydrated now that we know that. <laughs> um, so yeah, that marathon mile last night is your marathon pace, Heather. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's really up to you. I'm not going to say one way or the other, cause I don't want to take your joy. Um, I think it would be something to think about if you wanted to run after work in like around your work and by the time you finished, would traffic be better? Yeah. Going home. And would you <laughs> like, would that move the needle for you too? Okay. Yeah. But you'll be getting it on Saturday long runs. Maybe Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I could run on Sundays and, you know, a few days a week, I feel like maybe. And I feel like, too, if you're heat training or if you're running in the heat, not hitting your paces during a workout isn't a terrible thing, right? Because you're still working really hard. Yeah, the effort's still there. As long as the effort's there, you're making a huge win. You just don't see that uh, that immediate win, right? You don't see it on the watch. You're probably not going to feel it when you like save your run and then you're writing notes to me. You're probably not going to feel it. Right. But you will feel it once you get into fall and once you taper and go into your race day. My prediction for Chicago this year, and next year, because they're later races, I don't think heat's going to be a problem. Um, 
not like it has been in past years. I know, I know. Cross, cross the fingers. Because they've had two good years. But it is pretty late in October. It's like October 13th. Any other questions? Any other comments? <laughs> I have a question. It's not about heat or hydration. <laughs> um, I found on YouTube, there's this like um, US track Olympian. I'm not sure how to say her name. Uh, Cherry Hawkins or maybe, but um, she has a bunch of YouTube shorts that just give little like running technique tips. And one that I saw that was really interesting was like you like variations on all the, the drills that you have us do before workouts, like butt kicks and, and high knees and stuff and how you can change how you do them to um, decide whether you're like focusing on mobility versus specifically technique. Yeah. So, I didn't know there were multiple ways to do a butt kick or high knees. I, I should like link this hey. thing so that you all know what I'm talking about. I want to see this. Um, but I was curious, like, if we're warming up for, um, like, I guess I, ideally we we do both and like mobility version sometimes and technique version other times. But um, for our um, drills before workouts like is should we be prioritizing technique or, or mobility oh um drills before workout mm -hmm. that's when i'm doing I my think, butt kicks at least i think it's more of sorry there's a little fly um i think there's more uh it's more of a combination because we do drills to further our warm-up right like we we do the one and a half to two, maybe three mile warm up. We do our stretches. That's good mobility, right? The drills are there to not only help with our running form, which would be technique, but to also further warming up. So a lot of like the high knees, the butt kicks, that's going to really help when you go into that stride and making sure that you stay, um, that you stay healthy through that stride and that you can stay healthy through the workout. So I would say it's really both. Wrong okay. answer. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Melody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You could literally just do both. Right. You don't have to pick one. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to pick one. Right answer. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you can if you want to, but they <laughs> both serve a great, a greater good. I'm going to watch this video. Any other questions? Comments? Um, I have a question. Hello. Oh, hi, Michelle. <laughs> um, I have a question kind of about not necessarily like, um, well, no, it's fueling and substituting like actual like food or bars or something. Um, do you think it's okay to substitute, like if you practice and substitute like a bar or something is okay in, as opposed to a gel or, um, yeah. I mean, I've been successful with the gels. So I'm just wondering about like with Leadville, if I should be eating or if I should just stick with my gels. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Road runners, trail runners can absolutely substitute with real food or with bars. It's making sure that you're still getting in enough of what you need and training with it to make sure that it works with your stomach before race day. Oh, yeah. So you have yeah. like two weeks, <laughs> which is fine. Um, but I know people who will eat like dried fruit. We were talking last night, um, one guy on the team he like eats Sour Patch Kids instead of, because we were talking about spring energy gels and how they were like over $4 for one gel. And he's like, yeah, I just buy like this big bag of Sour Patch Kids and I eat them on my runs. And I mean, if you think about it, like 
that is kind of like a gel. It's just candy. And that's really what a gel is in certain ways. Right. Um, so I think as long as you find what works for you, dried fruit, I know athletes who've had like the actual applesauce packets or um, diced up potatoes or sweet potatoes even in like baggies. And I've run with that. Like whatever works for you, I think is great. I wouldn't I wouldn't follow the trends or the norms just based on what other people are doing. I would absolutely set yourself up for success. So Michelle, if you're thinking, wow, I have Michelle's running the Leadville heavy half marathon in like two weeks, 15 and a half miles at 10,000 feet of elevation. And then you get, you gain about 25 to 3000 feet. And then 3,500. I just looked, Oh my God. I'm, and then you go down. You're fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, you, I would take a step back and think about, all right, Michelle's goal is to finish it strong. She just raced a half. She absolutely crushed her half marathon. This is like a fun thing that she wants to do. Her goal is to like run strong. Okay, great. So what, like, how long do you think it's going to take you to run? And do you think taking gels for that amount of time is going to like suffice? Yeah, if that's good. Any inkling, no, I would start to incorporate something else. I would okay. absolutely suggest trying different gels and bringing over, if you're only doing gels, to do like a variety of different gels. I'll do that yeah. in the marathon for sure. It's yeah. like a minimum of two. I mean, I ate gummy bears um, last Saturday. <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, gummy bears were good, but yeah. And the superhuman um, nootropics SIS is great, guys, just so you know. Um, but so maybe. Good. Um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it will be great. You will be great. Thanks. Just sign off on that fall marathon whenever you get a chance, please. <laughs> Sarah loves me, guys, because I'm not a good planner, so I just throw stuff at her. <laughs> I get like this, this like short one line email today. Like, what do you think about or like, hey, busy week? I don't know what you said, like, or how's your week? Um, I think I said busy week, but you're like, how's your week? Uh, this marathon, I don't know. What did you say? Like this marathon, too close? <laughs> like, when is it? <laughs> like, let me pull out a calendar. Let me back up. Let's count the weeks. It actually works. Mm -hmm. So just let me know. Okay. Sorry, I'm a bad planner. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. No, it's not bad planning. Yeah, that's right. Ronald says maybe you're actually a good planner. <laughs> Thanks, Ronald. Yeah. <laughs> I think for anyone who has like a really good training base, so like you could theoretically train for a marathon in eight weeks. You really could. If you were coming off of like, having a marathon training cycle so that long run was like still kind of in your legs and then maybe you took like a few months to like do whatever you could absolutely train for a marathon in eight weeks and run it well do we want to do that maybe but we don't need to cool and michelle you haven't run a marathon in a while so we're we're not doing that oh <laughs> But your long run's there. Oh, yeah, kind of. I know it just feels like, I don't know if ever, anyone else ever feels like this, like your training cycle seems really good and you're doing consecutive longer runs on the weekend. So you're like, oh, well, should I just train for a marathon now? Because I'm already halfway there, right? And because marathon training kind of sucks. Well, for me. I never feel that way, Michelle. I mean, I feel like marathon training sucks, but never like, oh, I should just train for a marathon. Oh, <laughs> <You're special. laughs> Let's talk about this. Why does it suck? What no, I'm teasing. It doesn't suck. It's so okay. much fun. But I'm not like, oh, yeah, marathon. Oh, really? Eight weeks. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, well, you know. Leanne and I are like, we are not doing eight weeks. We want the full 12 or 16 because we love it. 
I, 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 love do, I do. I love like the long like tempo runs, which I may not be saying when we get closer to Chicago at like maybe 22 miles. I don't know, but, <laughs> to Heather. Um, but I love, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. But I get it. I think, you know, it can be really scary. I think too, if, um, if you haven't had a good cycle or you haven't worked with a coach where it feels supportive and you feel like you're growing in that space and it just feels really hard and rigid, it can absolutely feel like a grind. And I think on some levels it it, it can be a grind, right? Like waking up for a 22 mile long run, not everyone's going to be excited about that. Um, when I had a 25 mile long run last fall, I was so excited. And my coach texted me the night before and she's like, are you ready for this thing? And I'm like, yeah, I'm so excited. I have my route planned. I have my outfit planned. I'm waking up early. This is going to be so great. And she's like, really? Okay. And then like, it, there was like a workout component into it. And then like 10 miles into it, I was like, oh, this is really hard. And on paper, it looked very easy or, you know, it looked easy. It was like, it wasn't marathon pace. It was like that transition pace that a lot of you practice. And I thought, oh, I just have to run transition pace like for 20 miles. This will be fine. Like it was not fine. <laughs> it was very, very, very hard um, with like a five mile warm up. So um, anyways, I usually wake up bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to go for those long runs. They're great. Heather, maybe we should run together. No, I'm kidding. I enjoy my long runs. I enjoy marathon training. I just, I get nervous before my runs. I'm like yeah. nervous all the time. Oh. <laughs> no, I get that too. That's why I had to stop um, leading group runs in Denver when I had like quality long runs. There was too much anxiety going on because people were showing up late. I'm trying to like personally, like, I'm like, I just want to start my long run. We're waiting for people. There's a lot of questions. People are asking to jump into my long run. It's like, I just want to run alone. <laughs> or with like one person. <laughs> no, I get it. There's a lot of anxiety everywhere. It's the world we live in. It doesn't have to be that way, but it can feel that way. Michelle, you're shaking your head. Yeah. At me? Yes. Yeah. Because we love running. We well, love. Because you wake up excited about a 25 mile run. But maybe, I, I mean, maybe I would get there if I'm in a training cycle. You know, I haven't had a good marathon training cycle, apparently. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, you probably woke up in, like, your half marathon training cycle feeling great. Yeah. Right? Ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was having a really great training cycle. And every like workout long run was like A plus. So I'm like, yeah, let's do this thing, right? I think it's easy to fall into that kind of mindset rather than like if you're kind of having that ebb and flow of training, the rule of thirds, which is actually a great place to be in training. It's a great place to be. Um, you know, it can be harder, I think, to wake up and get excited about something like that if you're like, ooh, but the chances are this doesn't go well or whatever. Right. That can happen. I feel like making up a really good playlist, like something yeah. that you love to listen to and even like breaking it up into like sections of like, just say if you're doing a, a long run tempo, you're like the beginning of it is like chill music. And then you get to like your pump up section. And then again, like your cool down to like, you kind of make it up like that. And it just helps. I feel like, you look forward to it a little bit more and it just breaks up the run. Like it just kind of, you feel like it's in like little sections. That's a great idea. Yeah, it helps for like, yeah, I agree part. with that. Yeah. And it just kind of helps with the anxiety too. Cause you feel like, okay, I do that for my races as well, like marathons. So that I'm just thinking about like getting to the end of that section of the playlist and, you know, thinking about that versus how long I have to go. Yeah. That's if I have quality work in a long run during marathon training, sometimes for like the easy part, I'll listen to a book and then I'll switch to music during quality oh, work. That's good too. 
That's great. I'll switch like different eras for Taylor Swift. <laughs> That's, about it. That's where I got my idea for the doing the playlists and the different thing because I oh, thought really? she did the different eras. So I yeah. said, I'm going to do different genres. So I would do different genres for different parts of the marathon. Oh, so cool. She, she inspired it. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Yeah. That's so great. We'll have a plan too to help like chunk up the marathon so Chicago doesn't feel so overwhelming. So you feel like it's truly like focusing on like a 5K or a 10K at a time and kind of having a goal around that. Um, and hopefully that helps. Great. Any other comments? Questions? Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you all. It's nice to connect, like smaller groups. Some people I see weekly, some people I don't. So it's nice. nice yeah, nice thank, you. yeah thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's do this. Yeah, Ronald, hype us <laughs> right. up. That's so great. He's so positive. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank I you. Good night. Have a great weekend and a great night. You too. Bye. You too. Bye. <laughs>